over the past century, developed human societies have learned to tap groundwater for various uses. Thus, the question arises, are humans in competition with plants for the groundwater resource? Would excessive well pumping affect the health of vegetative ecosystems, particularly in arid regions where some plants are known to rely solely on groundwater? These are relevant questions because the health of arid vegetative ecosystems is at stake. The latter provide a host of natural services, including carbon fixation, erosion control, wildlife habitat, contaminant filtering, low albedo, and scenic beauty. These services may be impaired by the excessive pumping of groundwater. To understand where water comes from, how much of it is already committed by nature, and how much may be available for human use, we must take a close look at the hydrologic cycle. Water originates in the oceans, evaporates into the atmosphere, and moves inland, eventually to precipitate and convert into runoff, returning to the ocean to complete the cycle. While on land, Runoff separates into surface water and subsurface water. In turn, subsurface water is of two types, one, unsaturated flow, and two, saturated flow. Unsaturated subsurface flow lies within the vato zone. Saturated subsurface flow lies within the zone of saturation. The U.S. Geological Survey has estimated the quantity of groundwater as more than 100 times that of surface water. Thus, there is certainly a lot more groundwater than surface water. The advantage, however, appears to end there, because while surface water is generally fresh, the same does not follow for groundwater. The deeper the groundwater, the older it is, and consequently, the more saline it is likely to be. Also. While surface water flow is driven by gravity, groundwater pumping relies on imported energy. If the energy comes from burning fossil fuels, the carbon footprint increases. Thus, while surface water is entirely renewable, groundwater is not. The use of surface water is sustainable, while the use of groundwater may not be. Sustainability implies renewability. Lack of renewability is deemed to be unsustainable. All vegetative ecosystems satisfy their need for water by drawing either surface or subsurface water. Some may rely on surface water, some others on vato zone water, and yet some others on groundwater. The mix generally depends on type of species, climate, soils, geology, and geomorphology. In humid regions, where the water table is close to the ground surface, plants may get their water from all sources. However, in arid regions, where surface water is scanned, only plants that can successfully tap the groundwater may be able to survive the recurrent droughts.
How does groundwater pumping affect arid vegetative ecosystems? The answer to this question requires a thorough grounding in concepts of geology, geomorphology, hydrology, and ecology. In the following sections, we endeavor to examine these fields in search for effective ways of resolving the competition between well plants and pumping wells. Geology is the source of everything natural. Local geology interacts with the prevailing climate to condition the geomorphology. Geologic uplift is responsible for mountain building. In turn, mountains are eroded by the action of rain and gravity. The products of erosion are transported by runoff, eventually to settle in and fill the downstream valleys. The accumulation of water below the ground surface in aquifers has been occurring throughout geologic time. Aquifers are of two types, one fractured rock and two alluvial. Fractured rock aquifers are associated with mountains and uplands where rain is abundant and there is an active groundwater recharge. Alluvial aquifers are present in the soil filled valleys and lowlands where groundwater discharge generally takes place. The rate of recharge and discharge of an aquifer is a measure of the speed at which it replenishes following recharge and depletes following discharge. The timing response of fractured rock aquifers may be measured in days and months, while that of alluvial aquifers may be measured in years and decades. This is because the flow of water within a rock aquifer is advective through the fractures, typically in a two-dimensional mode at relatively high speeds. On the other hand, the flow of water within an alluvial aquifer is diffusive through the porous media, occurring at much slower speeds than those that could be attained by pure advection. Fractured rock and alluvial aquifers differ in the predominant mode of exfiltration. Fractured rock aquifers feature springs wherever fractures in the water table intersect at or near the ground surface. Springs are related to the number, size, and connectivity of fractures. Therefore, they reflect the local geology and tectonic activity. On the other hand, the exfiltration of alluvial aquifers is driven by the local geomorphology as characterized by stream bottoms, surface depressions, gravins, and so on. Fracture rock aquifers exfiltrate through springs Alluvial aquifers exfiltrate through the base flow of streams and rivers. The foregoing facts have a significant bearing upon the relation between groundwater and vegetation. Above a fractured rock aquifer, plants will colonize the immediate vicinity of springs, which for the most part are randomly distributed. This upland interaction between plants and groundwater takes place ostensibly in the absence of a clearly defined stream channel. Conversely, in an alluvial aquifer, plants are known to colonize the immediate vicinity of streams where the groundwater is shallowest. This riparian interaction takes place between plants and groundwater in the presence of a stream channel. This infrared image depicts a portion of Tierra del Sol in eastern San Diego County, California. Two branches of Tierra del Sol Creek are shown, featuring a riparian community of coast live oak, Kirkus agrifolia, shown in red color, sparsely populated along the two ephemeral stream channels. 
also shown on the bottom right, is a tightly packed upland linear forest of red shank, Adenostoma sparsifolium, which is fed by water exfiltrating through a fracture in the underlying rock. In nature, geology, geomorphology, hydrology, and ecology are thoroughly intertwined into a complex web of relations whose sole purpose is to sustain the vegetative systems. Significantly, geomorphology stands out as the glue that effectively ties all the other components together. The role of geomorphology is nowhere more marked than in arid regions, where it determines whether a plant or ecosystem will exist or not. An example of such determinacy is an oasis, a depression where the groundwater comes close enough to the surface to be within reach of the vegetation. In certain places, depending on the local geology and geomorphology, exfiltration may be of such magnitude as to feed small lakes embedded in otherwise desertic landscapes. For instance, this figure shows the Huacachina Lagoon, an oasis near Ica, Peru. Groundwater exfiltrates into this natural depression located within Peru's coastal desert. This figure shows the vegetational gradient along a cross-section of the Mojave River Valley at Camp Katy, California. It is seen that different species occupy different levels in the profile. The dimensions of the terraces depend on the proximity to groundwater, which is conditioned by the local topography, that is, by the geomorphology. Vegetational gradients of the type shown in the Mojave River Valley are not restricted to arid landscapes. This figure shows the sequence of Cerrado Campo Gallery Forest, which recurs in the subhumid, highly dissected savanna woodlands of Mato Grosso in central western Brazil. The Cerrado, or dense scrub forest, occupies the higher ground, out of reach of the groundwater. The Campo, that is the grassland, occupies the middle ground, subject to occasional flooding. The Gallery Forest occupies the lower ground, where there is a significant and active interaction with groundwater. In arid climates, surface water infiltrates into the groundwater as it flows over ephemeral streams. In humid climates, groundwater exfiltrates as the base flow of perennial streams. By definition, base flow comes from the groundwater. Therefore, the presence or absence of base flow is a good indication of whether groundwater is exfiltrating to the surface or not. Streams with characteristics in between those of ephemeral and perennial are referred to as intermittent. These streams may have base flow only during the wet or rainy season.
the hydrologic peak to low flow ratio helps quantify the role of groundwater. Generally, the larger the stream, the lower the peak to low flow ratio. For example, for the Amazon River, the largest in the world, the peak to low flow ratio ranges between 2 and 3, the lowest in the world. In contrast, much smaller streams may have quite large peak to low flow ratios, depending on the local geology, geomorphology, and soils. For example, the Piraí River in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, may reach peak to low flow ratios exceeding 1,000 for a few days during the wet season, January to March. Large quantities of base flow are made possible by a shallow water table. In turn, this leads to a substantial interaction between vegetation and groundwater. In this case, plants are not limited by lack of water, being able to use all types of water, including surface water, vados water, and groundwater proper. A total absence of base flow implies a water table below the stream bottom sometimes at a great depth. In this case, plants do not use surface water. Instead, they send their roots often to great depths to tap the underlying groundwater. These are the phreatophytes documented by Meinzer. In summary, local climate, geology, geomorphology, and hydrology interact to either foster or discourage the development of vegetation. In particular, in semi-arid and arid regions, more often than not, the presence of phreatophytes is an indication of the proximity of groundwater. In these cases, the depth of the water table may vary from a few feet to as much as 50 to 60 feet. Depending on the local climate, geology, and geomorphology, plants and animals organize themselves in distinct communities where various species may coexist. A plant community is a collection or association of plant species within a designated geographical unit or habitat, which forms a relatively uniform patch distinct from other patches. See, for instance, the two distinct habitats shown here A, an arid desert which is crossed by a perennial stream, and b, a humid tropical montane forest. A plant community may be described either floristically, the plant species, or physiognomically, the plant's appearance. The floristic description refers to the various vegetative species present in the community. The physiognomic description focuses on the physical structure of the community its characteristic height, canopy density, and specimen size, trunk diameter at breast height. Plants require inputs of solar energy, carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients. Solar energy varies primarily with latitude. Plants in tropical and temperate regions are able to get their energy needs during the day or significantly during the growing season. Carbon dioxide exists in the air in concentrations that are sufficient for plants to avail themselves of as much carbon and oxygen as needed. Therefore, the limiting factors are water and nutrients.
field observation indicates that the amount of biomass is directly related to the amount of environmental moisture. Compare, for instance, the driest and wettest spots on Earth. The Atacama Desert in northern Chile, with near zero precipitation, is the driest spot. On the other hand, Cherrapunji in Meghalaya, India, with close to 12,000 millimeters of mean annual precipitation, is the wettest spot. The tallest trees on Earth are the California coastal redwoods. Sequoia sempervirens. The coastal redwood is a long-lived evergreen tree, living 1,200 to 1,800 years or more. The species includes the tallest trees on record, measuring up to 379 feet in height and up to 26 feet in diameter at breast height. Its natural habitat is coastal Northern California, particularly in Humboldt and Del Norte counties, where mean annual precipitation reaches 125 inches, the largest in California. Its natural habitat extends to the adjoining southern coast of Oregon. The widest tree in the world is a Montezuma cypress, Taxodium mucronatum, located in Santa Maria del Tule, about six miles east of the city of Oaxaca, Mexico. In 2005, its trunk had a circumference of 137.8 feet, which represents a diameter of 43.9 feet. The best estimate for the age of this tree, based on growth rates, is 1,433 to 1,600 years. The tree is located near the center of a narrow valley between two hills within the confines of the broader valley of Oaxaca. The mean annual precipitation in the area averages 746 millimeters, a bit less than the global average, 800 millimeters. Therefore, the ample moisture that sustained this remarkable tree must originate in local groundwater from the nearby hills. All vegetation responds readily to moisture inputs from all sources, including surface, soil, groundwater, and air. Absence of water is definitely limiting. On the other hand, ample water leads to trees of great size, such as the California redwoods. Too much water may lead to a dearth of nutrients due to soil leaching through geologic time. However, large tropical forests, such as the Amazon, are able to store nutrients in their extensive canopy and recycle them as appropriate. The preceding examples have shown conclusively that the presence of water has a direct bearing on the physiognomy, that is, height and density, of vegetation. This fact is nowhere clearer than in a desert landscape, where the size differences may be attributed to the prevailing gradient in the depth of the water table. For instance, Brown, in 1923, has documented the height of mesquite, Prosopis species, between two wells located in the Coachella Valley near the Salton Sea, California. Mesquite grows as a dense forest 10 to 25 feet high along the eastern well, and of somewhat less size, 6 to 8 feet, on high sand dunes to the west. Within a distance of two miles from east to west, the depth of the water table increases from 32 feet to 75 feet. Ostensibly, mesquite does not grow beyond a depth of the water table of 50 feet. In fracture rock aquifers, the influence of moisture availability on the height and density of vegetative ecosystems is confirmed by the existence of linear forests, or liniment. This figure shows a remarkable linear forest of tall red shank, Adenostoma sparsifolium, in Tierra del Sol, San Diego County, California. This forest is fed by water exfiltrating through a linear fracture in the underlying rock.
another example of the connection between geologic features, groundwater, and vegetation in an upland environment is the lone specimen of coast live oak shown here. This large tree sits next to a spring. Note the dark spot in the foreground and the bathtub. Located at the western downstream edge of the large dike shown on right. Among these other costs or impacts are water table depletion, progressively making it harder for all users of the aquifer to pump groundwater. Loss of wetlands, including possible impairment of oasis, phreatophytic, and spring-fed vegetation. Loss of baseload and riparian corridors, which may trigger changes in channel morphology and lead to stream bank erosion and increased sediment loads. Land subsidence, for instance, see the Las Vegas experience. Saltwater intrusion in coastal environments. Time photographs of a protruding well in Las Vegas, Nevada, showing evidence of land subsidence. Aquifers may be of two types, one, unconfined, and two, confined. Unconfined aquifers lie near the surface and for the most part constitute shallow groundwater. Confined aquifers lie at greater depths below a confining layer and often under pressure. Confined aquifers may constitute either shallow or deep groundwater, depending on the characteristics of the regional groundwater flow system. Wells are of three types, one, water table well, two, artesian well, and three, flowing artesian well. In a water table well, the water table is at atmospheric pressure. In an artesian well, the water pressure is greater than atmospheric. In a flowing artesian well, the water pressure is such that it can flow freely above the ground surface. Pumping from a water table well lowers the groundwater levels near the well. The affected zone is known as the cone of depression, and the land surface above it its area of influence. Well pumping changes the natural direction and amount of groundwater flow within the area of influence. If two cones of depression overlap, the interference reduces the water available to each well. Well interference can be a problem when many wells are competing for the water of the same aquifer, particularly at the same depth.
What is patently clear is that any amount of pumping, if not put back into the aquifer, is a capture. And this capture has a net effect on the water table. To illustrate, this figure shows three stages in the development of groundwater systems. A. A pristine system with pumping equal to zero. That is, no pumping, where natural discharge equals natural recharge. B. A developed system, typically in equilibrium state, where pumping equals captured recharge plus captured discharge. And C. A depleted system, typically in non-equilibrium state, where pumping equals increasing amounts of capture recharge plus capture discharge plus capture storage. Developed and depleted groundwater systems generally result in a lowering of the water table. The greater the amount of capture, the greater the amount of depletion. Thus, sustainable groundwater systems aim to make sure that the lowering of the water table does not cause undesirable or unacceptable consequences. In practice, this requirement effectively limits groundwater pumping to a small percentage of the gross recharge. It is clear that both plants and wells pump groundwater. This fact has been amply confirmed by theory and experience. The two systems, one natural, plants, and the other anthropogenic, wells, when located in close proximity of each other, are actually drawing water from the same reservoir. Therefore, the question arises, are wells in competition with the plants for the groundwater resource? If well pumping results in a lowering of the water table within reach of the roots, the answer is an unequivocal yes. In conclusion, plants and wells are seen to be in competition for the groundwater resource, particularly in semi-arid and arid regions, where groundwater may be the only source of water for most plants. Phreatophytes are counting on the groundwater for their livelihood, and if the groundwater table is lowered beyond their reach by anthropogenic action, they will eventually die and therefore cease to provide a host of natural services. Both riparian and upland ecosystems are likely to be negatively impacted by groundwater pumping. Riparian ecosystems are typically longitudinal along the stream and tap the water table in the dissected and filled alluvial landscape. On the other hand, upland ecosystems, particularly in mountainous regions, are more likely to be randomly distributed and to follow the fractures and springs. In semi-arid and arid landscapes, the situation may be more acute because of the limited number of springs. Lowering of the water table as a result of pumping will encroach upon the livelihood of many desert vegetative species. The mesophytes will be particularly affected since these typically require substantial amounts of water. The latter flows in springs and under depressions, following paths established by local geology and geomorphology. The preceding sections have presented clear evidence 
of the competition between groundwater use and vegetative ecosystems. Climate, geology, and geomorphology have conditioned the type and extent of vegetation throughout geologic time. On the other hand, intensive groundwater use made possible by mechanical pumping has occurred only in the past 100 years or so. In order to reconcile the apparent competition, the following questions are posed. Around the world, users of groundwater face the following realities. 1. There is not enough surface water to satisfy all the perceived needs or uses. 2. Local groundwater is less expensive than imported surface water. 3. The available surface water may have been all appropriated, thus there is no other recourse but to tap the local groundwater. It is recognized that all groundwater of economic use is in transit to the surface waters. Thus, the existence of groundwater as an additional resource is subject to interpretation. In many instances, groundwater is seen to be cheaper than surface water, but when all environmental costs are considered, the difference in cost may be reduced and possibly even reversed. While surface water is completely renewable, the same statement does not follow for groundwater. Therefore, usage of groundwater must be done with caution, anticipating and mitigating the impacts that this usage may have on local stakeholders, both natural and anthropogenic. Plants provide a host of natural services, many of which still remain to be quantified in conventional economic terms. First and foremost, all green plants sequester carbon dioxide, thus helping to control the climate. A permanent reduction in plant biomass has exactly the same effect as burning an additional amount of fossil fuels. In addition to carbon fixation and oxygen production, plants provide several other natural services, including erosion control, habitat for wildlife, filtering of contaminants, low albedo, which encourages rain, and scenic beauty all of which have an intrinsic value. Thus, the impairment of ecosystem health by excessive groundwater pumping could have far-reaching consequences, encompassing aspects of climatology, biology, sedimentology, and public recreation. The competition between plants and wells is most critical in arid and semi-arid environments, where many plants rely almost exclusively on groundwater. Thus, Pumping in a desert environment is most crucial, not only because of the dependence of the vegetation on the groundwater resource, but also because replenishment is likely to be slow, with recharge events few and far between. Groundwater pumping may not be as crucial in a humid environment, because in this case, surface water may be plentiful, largely eliminating the need for pumping. A middle ground may be found in the relatively new concept of sustainable yield. The amount of groundwater capture should not be based on the outdated hydrogeologic principle of safe yield. Instead, the allowable capture must be that which can be maintained for an indefinite period of time without causing unacceptable environmental, economic, or social consequences. These consequences would have to be carefully evaluated and accounted for in the economic analysis before the planned groundwater development takes place. The latter requirement calls for renewed interdisciplinary syntheses in groundwater resource evaluation to include ecology, surface water hydrology, and the economics of natural resources. The following conclusions are derived from this study. Climate, geology, geomorphology, and hydrology interact to foster or discourage the development of vegetation.
Many plants in arid and semi-arid regions rely almost exclusively on groundwater to satisfy their basic need for water. The presence or absence of water has a direct bearing on the height, width, and type and density of vegetation. The concept of safe yield of groundwater has been widely discredited because it assumes that groundwater is a volume when in fact it is a flow. In a pristine groundwater system, gross recharge equals gross discharge, therefore net recharge is zero. Plants and wells are in competition for groundwater. This competition is most critical in arid and semi-arid environments, where many plants rely almost exclusively on groundwater. Developed shallow groundwater systems result in a lowering of the water table. The greater the amount of capture, the greater the amount of lowering. All groundwater of economic use is in transit to the surface waters. Thus, the existence of groundwater as an additional resource is not always to be guaranteed. Riparian ecosystems are typically longitudinal, tapping the water table in the dissected and filled alluvial landscape. Upland ecosystems are more likely to be randomly distributed in space and to follow fractures, springs, and other geologic features. Capture that results in a substantial lowering of the water table has a host of negative impacts, of which the most important is a permanent reduction in plant biomass. A permanent reduction in plant biomass has exactly the same effect as burning an additional amount of fossil fuels, thereby increasing the carbon footprint. Usage of groundwater must be exercised with caution, anticipating the impacts that it may have on local stakeholders, both natural and anthropogenic. The allowable groundwater capture must be that which can be maintained for a reasonable time without causing unacceptable environmental, ecological, economic, or social consequences. There is an urgent need for renewed interdisciplinary syntheses in groundwater resource evaluation to include ecology, surface water hydrology, and the economics of natural resources.